So this brings me to, um, I guess, the background behind um, Kerry's project, the accumulation of smoke-derived volatile phenols. We've had a lot of anecdotal evidence from industry that smoke taint intensifies during the winemaking process and certainly that you can take grapes that don't appear to exhibit a, any smoky character, ferment them and then the taint is released at a later date. So one aspect of Christian's work we touched on was essentially to investigate the evolution of volatile phenols during fermentation. And during the fermentation of unsmoked or control grapes, any trace levels of any of the volatile phenols could be detected. So you can see here in the free run juice, and again this is Merlot, um, we couldn't detect any of the phenols um, in the free run juice. After alcoholic or primary fermentation, there were traces of, of guacol and 4-methyl guacol, and after malolactic fermentation, again, small amounts of these compounds present only. In contrast to what we observed for um, the fermentation of the smoke, grapes where we see a progressive release of volatile phenols the entire way through winemaking. So again, only trace levels could be detected in the free run juice, but we can see that as we continue to macerate um, our ferments as they, they progress, we can see for all of these compounds a steady increase in, in concentration. After alcoholic fermentation, um, we're up around 249 micrograms per litre of, of guacol. But what was interesting was, at this point, the grapes were pressed, or the, the must was pressed from the skins. We continue to see the release of all of these compounds um, during malolactic fermentation. So whereas this release might have been attributed to simple extraction of these compounds from, from skin tissues, we now know that there's also something else going on, and, and this supports the, the hypothesis for precursor compounds. Now, that's not to say that during primary fermentation there wasn't extraction from skins but we think it's probably a combination of the two processes. <coughs> okay and this really suggests two things that are going on. One is it confirms the presence of, of precursor forms of volatile phenols in our grapes and it also suggests that there's some conjugation of volatile smoke components taking place in the, in the grapevine. There's obviously some interesting biochemistry going on that we need to try and understand. To try and understand where these volatile phenols are coming from during fermentation, we went on to conduct a series of hydrolytic experiments um, and we conducted three. One where we used mild acid hydrolysis conditions, so we took our free run juice, the same Merlot free run juice as before, and hydrolyzed it um, at juice pH, so approximately 3.5 for uh, one hour at 100 degrees. We had a strong acid hydrolysis where we adjusted the pH of the juice to one and then the same 100 degrees for one hour. And this is essentially the glycose or glucose assay. And we also conducted enzyme hydrolysis where we added in beta-glucosidase enzyme which had been extracted from almonds um, and treated that at 30 degrees for 24 hours. And again what we found was, was quite interesting. For our control samples um, under all of these conditions again we could only pick up trace levels of, of any of the volatile phenols. In our mild acid hydrolysis of the smoke tainted juice again we could only detect trace levels of these compounds so what that suggests is at mild pH so what, what takes place during um, winemaking these compounds aren't being released from simple acid hydrolysis and it would also suggest that they're relatively stable to heat as well and, and that was sort of supported by literature evidence that we've got that glycosides are actually quite resilient to, to, um, to acid hydrolysis, to mild acid hydrolysis. However what was interesting was under strong acid hydrolysis conditions we liberated large quantities of predominantly guacol and 4-methyl guacol but also 4-ethyl guacol and 4-ethyl phenol um, and perhaps one of the things I forgot to mention was in the analysis of both smoke, of smoke composition, both vapour phase and aqueous extracts, guacol and 4-methyl guacol are, are the two phenols that, are most, that occur most predominantly, so um, it sort of supports that, that work as well. The other thing that we found was that our enzyme treatment also released um, each of these phenols, um, but not, not quite to the same degree. Um, and probably interestingly enough that what we're releasing in the strong acid hydrolysis, those levels are, are 
relatively similar to what we observed at the end of, at the end of fermentation. So the hydrolytic release of phenols further supports our hypothesis for the presence of precursors and the release following the addition of beta-glucosidase beta enzyme suggested to me sort of a glycoconjugate nature of these precursors, so um, you know, conjugation with sugar molecules. So one example of this might be um, a beta-D-glucopyranoside, beta and what I've shown here is the glycoside of, of guacol. And there's plenty of literature, literature precedents for glycosylation of, of flavour compounds. Um, both monoterpenoids and norisoprenoids um, in grapes exist in, in glycoside form, as well as the oak lactones in oak wood. So the specific aim of Kerry's project is essentially to investigate the provenance of glycoconjugate precursors of glycol in, uh, following grapevine exposure to smoke. So to date she has synthesised um, a reference sample of the glycoside of glycol and for my fellow chemists in the room this was achieved in two steps by treating glycol with um, a protected, uh, sugar, pro yeah, protected sugar unit to achieve this protected glycoside and then in the second step we just remove the protecting groups to obtain our, our glycoside. And this glycol glucoside has been um, characterised by liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry. <clears throat> and essentially what this does is it gives us a chemical fingerprint of this compound. So the fragmentation of our glycol glucoside um, it occurs the same way each time we analyse the compound. So the molecular weight of this entire compound is 286 um, atomic mass units. During the analysis process, um, it's combined with the solvent, and that gives us this fragment here of 345, but the loss of the fragment takes us back to 285, which is our, our glycoside less a proton. So that's the first fragment that we see. If we then split our glycoside in two, as shown here, we get a glycol fragment with a mass of 123, corresponding to this fragment here, and a second sugar residue here, the mass of 161, corresponding to this fragment here. So we now have the chemical fingerprint of our glycol glycoside. But is it present in smoke-tainted juices or smoke-affected juices? So we obtained a number of juice samples. Um, one was provided by industry, actually given to us by, um, by Con Simos, his, his smoke-affected Sangiovese juice. And this was exposed in a, in a commercial setting to bushfire smoke um, from Victoria. We also obtained some samples from Christian Kennison's work where we had Chardonnay grapes that were experimentally exposed to smoke and then also equivalent Chardonnay grapes that weren't exposed to smoke, so we had a control. The first trace is our reference compound, so you can see got one nice peak, um, so the student obviously made a nice pure sample. The different colours just relate to those different mass transitions, so they're essentially just the different fragment ions that we're looking at. If we have a look at the juice of the Sangiovese grapes, we can see lots of different things that have those fragments present, but most importantly we can see a peak with the same retention time. So this suggests to us that the glycol glycoside was present in this juice sample. We also see the same peak in the smoked Chardonnay juice, but what we were interested to see was that it's more or less absent in the unsmoked Chardonnay juice.